Yeah, well, now, nothing like cheating. So we're in James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, right? Okay. You know what I titled this? You know what I titled it. Scorched Earth Syndrome. You'll find out why. So my notes say, the book of James, week 6, James 3, 1 through 12, Scorched Earth Syndrome. Let's start with the introduction. How many of you know that sometimes we say things we don't really mean to say? I like to start out that way. What do we tell our spouses, men, when we mess up and lose our temper and say things we shouldn't say? I really didn't mean to say that, right? And, and that's the truth. We didn't mean to say it. It's in the, in the spur of the moment. But you know, you know what they say? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth blabbeth. What's on the inside is going to come out. Amen? So sometimes, guys, and I know women too. I'm married for 47 years. Sometimes we're downright mean in our speech. Are we not? An elderly man had serious hearing problems for several years, and it wasn't me. <laughs> I've had, not, and this story's not about me, all right? Don't be thinking, wow, Okay. An elderly man had serious hearing problems for several years. His family tried again and again to convince him to get a hearing aid. Finally, he relented. He went to the doctor and was fitted with a set of hearing aids that allowed him to hear clearly. A month later, he went back to the doctor. How many of you ever had a follow-up visit with your doctor? The doctor said with a smile, your hearing is perfect. Your family must be really pleased that you can hear again. The old man replied, oh, I haven't told my family yet. <laughs> To me, that was funny because I, 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 I feel like I know this guy. They still think I can't hear, but I just sit around and listen to their conversations, <laughs> which I think is even funnier. He said, I've changed my will three times. <laughs> All of us say things that we later wish we hadn't have said, don't we? I'm not aware that someone has changed their will over some I've said. I, I, but speaking appropriately, it's a constant struggle for every one of us. Amen? So in our text today, James is concerned about taming our tongues. He wants your speech and mind to be wholesome. He wants it to be gracious. Can you say amen? So with that in mind, let's read James chapter 3, 12 verses. And I've got to move steady tonight, so bear with me. I, I've got a clip right along here, but I'll try not to go too fast. My brethren, not, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. How many times have you heard me say, I'm going to be held accountable for what I teach you? So I try to be careful, and I try to be accurate. Amen? Because I'll stand before God and be judged as a pastor with a calling to be a pastor, and I've been given a pastor's heart, and I've been called to be a teacher. So I have to be careful with that. Does that make sense? So, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. That means a mature. Able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, whatever the pilot desires. So the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a force a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets the fire and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. I have to pause here just for a second. It's not in my notes. But I'm reminded of this, and you need to know it. How many of you ever asked this question, why do bad things happen to good people? You ever... You ever heard the question or thought that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's in this scripture. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. Now, what that means, and I'm in the New King James Version of the Bible here, but it seems a little different. What this is saying here is that the course of nature, the world, the world, not the church, not Christians, but the course of nature, the world, has been set on fire of hell. That's why 
I mean, the course of nature, this world does things. Have you ever noticed that weather is just weather? Weather is a law that's been released in the world by God, and weather does what weather does. Does that make sense to you? And the course of nature, the world, structure has been set on fire of hell, and that's why things happen in this world that we don't like. And we have more control over it than we let ourselves believe that we do in our prayer life. Amen? We've been given the name of Jesus that we can come against it. I've had people argue with me that, well, I think it means that the, the tongue is on fire. No, the tongue sets fires. It's not on fire, it sets fires. Read it. Read it. And the purpose, uh, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. And I'll, I'll tell you why I said what I said. It's further in the, in the uh, message, and we'll get there. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the solemnitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Sometimes we say things we really don't mean to say. I'm repeating it. Perhaps we've seen the following questions from lawyers which were taken from official court records nationwide, and I'm a former cop. These things I'm about to read to you are true. They were said in court by lawyers asking questions. One, was that the same nose you... Now, you got to think about that. Lawyers asking somebody on the sand, was that the same nose you broke as a child? Second one, was it you or your brother that was killed in the war? <laughs> and he's talking to somebody, right? Next one, the youngest son, the 20-year-old, how old is he? <laughs> are, you, are you following with me? All right, all right, maybe I'm reading too fast. Were you alone or by yourself? Do you have any children or anything of that kind? <laughs> were you present in court this morning when you were sworn in? <laughs> That's hilarious to me. Now, doctor, isn't it true that when a person dies in his sleep, in most cases he just passes quietly away and doesn't know anything about it until the next morning? <laughs> Said by a lawyer in a courtroom. These questions were asked by well-meaning lawyers simply trying their best to be clear and concise, and they went overboard. And all those slips of the tongue can be funny far too often. They're anything but funny. It is a fact that taming our tongues is anything but an easy task. In verse 7 and 8 of our text, James writes, All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So, we can train Flipper. We, we can train Trigger. We can train Shamu. We can train Lassie. We can train Falcons to land on our wrists. Pigeons to carry our messages. Dogs to fetch our papers. Elephants to stand on rolling balls. Tigers to sit on stools. And alligators to turn over and get their bellies rubbed. Amen? But James says no man can tame the tongue. It's a battle some people just seem never to win. On a windswept hill. I was going to skip that, but I ain't going to. On a, swind, a windswept hill in an English country churchyard stands a drab gray slab tombstone. If you sit over it and look closely, you'll be able to see the faint etchings which read, Beneath this stone a lump of clay lies Arabella Young who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. <laughs> Got to dig a little deep for the humor. Yeah, that was a little dark. But surely this battle with the tongues is winnable. Sometime before death, wouldn't you hope? It is. Follow with me. It is winnable. Every child of God can win. Can you say amen? And in order to help you do that, James outlines four critical truths from the passage of Scripture we've already read about taming your tongue. One, first point tonight, your tongue is a mark 
of your spiritual maturity. That's true, coming from verse 1 and 2, right? Your tongue is a mark of your spiritual maturity. James says, in effect, if you want to know how spiritually mature you are, consider your tongue. What are the words of your mouth like when nobody's around or when you lose your temper? Amen? He makes this point by speaking first to those in the church who held the office of a teacher. It's important. We can't just brush that over. Verse 1 again, he writes, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more. In the early church, teachers were held in very high esteem. And because of that, many insincere people were seeking to be teachers. Sometimes people want to be things because they want to be recognized for being spiritual. God help us all, amen? So James says, not many of you should aspire to become teachers because even though the position may at times appear to have high status, teachers will face a stricter judgment. They will be held accountable to God for what they have said to others in his name. But look at verse 2. So James goes on in verse 2 to make the point that all people will be held accountable before God for the use of their tongues, teachers and non-teachers alike, because he writes, we all stumble in many ways. I'm paraphrasing. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. James is saying here, that although teachers will be judged more strictly for the use of their words, everyone, say that with me, everyone, everyone, one more time, everyone, that's what make sure I'm not putting you to sleep here. Everyone, that's an important word, right? Everyone else will still face judgment for the words they speak as well. The one who learns to control his tongue, teacher or non-teacher, James calls a, a, mature, a mature person. That's hard to say a mature man. But we all know it's a mature person, right? Are you with me? The Greek term used for perfect man describes a completeness and a fullness of character that marks one who is spiritually mature. The point is that the person who has learned to control his tongue is also the type of person whom you can be sure will have control over the rest of their body. Did you hear what I just said? James is stressing that the power of the tongue, when it is unruly and out of control, is a mark of a person whose life is out of control. And a person whose tongue is under control is the sign of a person who has their life under control. So you think James knows this is important? Genuine faith will always show itself in our speech. Genuine faith will always show itself in our speech. Your tongue, although very small, is very powerful. Can you say amen? We know that in verses 3 through 5. James makes his point by using two interesting illustrations. In verse 3, he compares the tongue to a small bit. In the mouth of a large horse, he says, when we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. The picture is that of a large, healthy horse running across an open field. And although it is powerful enough to do what it wants and to go its own way, a rider is able to control that massive animal by means of a small bit in the horse's mouth, a bit which is only about four ounces of steel great big horse weigh a thousand pounds you can steer it with four ounces of steel in their mouth amen and he says in verse four or take ships as an example although they're so large and are driven by strong winds they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants it to go james is referring here to ships that traveled on the Mediterranean Sea, and some of them weighed as, as uh, many, many tons. And many of the rudders that steered those ships were only about a foot long. And it could steer a massive vessel. Isn't that something? You know, with the power of a song, Adolf Hitler convinced tens of thousands of Aryan supremacy and eventually brought about the Jewish Holocaust, which killed millions of Jews. The words of one man. Karl Marx said, give me 26 mighty soldiers and I'll conquer the world. 
What were the 26 soldiers he was talking about? Somebody tell me. The what? The alphabet. Karl Marx knew. He said, give me 26 mighty soldiers and I'll conquer the world. He was referring to the 26 letters of the alphabet. And yet, it is with the tongue. Listen to me now. The parents and teachers stretch the minds of children and young people. Attorneys offend their clients. Ambassadors represent their nations. And mothers sing their babies to sleep at night. Think about it. Without the tongue, no one could comfort those who are suffering or share the message of God's love and forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Without the tongue, our communication would be reduced to unintelligible grunts and shrugs. God's given us a tremendous privilege by creating us in his image. Isn't that powerful? Tremendous responsibility. It's our tongue, although it's very small. God's created us in his image, and thereby he gave us the ability to communicate. And to whom much is given, much is required. Amen? Your God-given ability carries with it a tremendous responsibility. Your tongue, although very small, is very powerful. Point number three. Your tongue has the potential to be very destructive. This is bore out in chapter 3, verses 5 through 8. In verses 5 through 6, James tells us that the tongue can be as destructive as a spreading flame. Now, here's where he his attention. He said, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great force is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire world of evil among the uh, parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. There are some great forests in the United States of America, yet every, every year thousands of acres of beautiful forests are destroyed by someone who leaves a smoldering campfire. Can you say amen? It happens. And beautiful forests are destroyed by someone who leaves smoldering ash in a campfire or carelessly tosses a cigarette out of a car window. From just a little spark, an entire forest can be set ablaze. So it is with words. One word of gossip, one lie, one insinuation, one harsh criticism, and a fire began. Human hearts dry from a lack of genuine love, then catch fire, and it spreads from heart to heart across the community, and there leaves behind it charred and burned reputations, broken hearts, and broken homes. And the damage can be so severe and extensive. James tells us there's a whole world of evil that the tongue can bring to pass. Those who spread gossip and slander are being used by Satan to cause discord, strife, and pain between people. Sound familiar, Isaac? Isn't that what you were referring to earlier in the service? Wow. When James says the tongue is a restless evil, he's still thinking of the animals referred to in verse 7. Like a lion behind the bars of a cage, it still stalks back and forth. It's restless. You open the door, and back it goes, back into the wild. In other words, if you let yourself, even after you start thinking to yourself, you got your life in order, you got your tongue under control, you have this under control, or you have that under control, and from this spectrum to this spectrum, a lot of junk fits in there. And you just open the door one time, it'll creep back out. Amen? What can we do about it? We're going to find out. We need to control it today, and it can still leap out tomorrow. It can, it can speak kindly now, but it can turn and spit out hatred in a moment. It's a restless evil waiting to break free. In verse 8, it says, it's full of deadly poison. Full of deadly poison in my mouth. Your words can be like a snake in the grass that sinks its fangs and then crawls off. And yet its poison remains to hurt, destroy, and possibly even kill. Once the poison is injected, it's very hard to extract. That's true of our words. It can be like a verbal cyanide. Now listen to this. This is a quote from a story. I don't know, I don't know where it was from, but 
Listen carefully because I'm telling you, even if you try to say it's not true, this is powerful. Some time ago, a dead woman was pulled from a river around Los Angeles. You have to know me to understand why these stories get to me, but you, you understand, don't you? I mean, I've seen all kinds of things in my lifetime, and every now and then they get to me, okay? But Jesus is still on the throne. God is still the God of my heart, amen? Some time ago, a dead woman was pulled from a river around Los Angeles. She had committed suicide. They searched her for identification but could find none. In fact, there was nothing on her person except one single piece of paper. And on that scrap of paper, there were two words. The words were, they said. Who said? No one knew. What was said, they couldn't find out. But those words, whatever they were, spoken as they were, were as deadly as a smoking revolver or a 12-inch knife. So our tongues has the potential to be very destructive. I apologize. Next point, number four. Your tongue can be a great power for good. Amen? Verses 9 through 12. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? This is... This is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. James is giving you words from God. God wants to know how fresh water, salt water can come out of the same spring. Because he didn't create us to be that way. Amen? My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So what's James reminding us of here? He's remind, reminding us that he is speaking to Christians. In verse 9, he says, Praise our Lord, and for whom God is both Lord and Father. These are people who have come to faith in Christ. Is that not me and you? And now have the new ability and responsibility to use our tongues for good and not for evil. And then we get to verses 11 and 12. James says the true Christians are now to use their tongues so that they become like fountains of fresh water and trees that bear much good fruit. That's what he's getting at. Forget the bad stuff. We're too familiar with the bad stuff. Let's get consistent with the good stuff. Amen? In Proverbs chapter 10, the first part of verse 11, it says, we're told that the mouth of the right of life that's Proverbs 10, verse 11. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Is your mouth a fountain of life every day, all day, that you're conscious? In Proverbs chapter 10, the first part of verse 20, it says, The tongue of the righteous is like choice silver. Proverbs chapter 10, first part of verse 21 says, The lips of the righteous nourish many. Then in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, we're told the tongue of the wise brings healing. God wants your tongue to be an instrument of forgiveness, encouragement, wisdom, and healing in the lives of many he brings our way. The Proverbs say that the tongue has the power of life and death, Proverbs 18, 21. The, the tongue has the power of life and death. Death words destroy hurt and create hateful and humiliating feelings life words build and increase strength of character they lift spirits they center on the truth and they set people free who would otherwise be in bondage we're going to end tonight the conclusion with this question but how can we do it don't you want to know, how can we do it? How can we do it? You know, um, men have things they face in their life. Women have things they face in their life. And, but both have this in common. 
But how do we stop? Pay attention. How can we tame our tongue? And if, if you can tame your tongue, it says you can, you can deal with all of those other things. Just start with the tongue. Have you ever heard me say this before? If you want to change your life, change the things that you think and the words that you say. Amen? You have to change the way you think and you have to change how you talk. Amen? All right, so how do we do it? How can we tame our tongue? Doesn't James still tell us in verse 8 that no man can tame the tongue? Did you read that? I read it. And, 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 and how many of you know the word of God is true, right? But listen. The good news is that what man cannot do, God can do. That's hope right there. That should boost your faith. What man can't do or a woman can't do. Amen. Don't want to leave you ladies out. What we can't do, God can do. And you might say, well, why doesn't he do it? Well, you know what? You got to let him do it. And you got to want it. You got to start with God changing your want to's. Amen. Oftentimes, we're not set free because we don't want to be free. Why don't we just be honest with ourselves? And sometimes it's that way because we say uh, to ourselves, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried. Do you know what you're saying? You're saying the Word of God is a lie. Because the Word of God, though, it's truth. And it says, I can do some things, all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. You know what that tells me? The fault doesn't lie with God. The fault lies with me. I have to let God do it. Amen? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me to do it. Amen? Because I'm going to tell you something. That thing in your life that you're, you're, you're struggling with. And you're, uh, stay in the fight. Don't quit struggling. Don't give up, in other words. Quit that. That's, not, that's what the devil wants you to do, but stop that. Stop giving up. And stop getting buried under so much condemnation, condemnation that you don't. Sometimes you find yourself not resisting, not fighting at all. You go, what's the use? You know why I know these things? I've been there. I've been there. You think for one minute I'd stand up in this pulpit and look down my nose at you? God would call me on that. And he would grade my paper. Right? You know how strongly I believe in the word of God. The guy asked me, he said, are you really sure that God can't make a mistake? I said, let me just say for the sake of argument, if God could make a mistake, are you going to grade his paper? Who's going to grade God's paper? People try it all the time. Now listen to me. I'm not, I'm not you know, hammering people who do this because I, I understand the attack of Satan on people's lives. I understand that. But there are people who think God's done something wrong. And, and maybe at one time or another, all of us have thought that because of maybe a tragedy or something's gone wrong. Am I the only one that's ever, you know, faced that sort of thing, you know? But God didn't do anything wrong. And the fact that he doesn't always explain all that to us just proves that he's God. If he's God, no one will ever force him to lay all of his cards on the table. Because if you could do that, he wouldn't be God. Amen? So, doesn't James still tell us in verse 8 that no man can tame the tongue? What then are you to do? You must first realize that James' emphasis here is on the words, no man but God. Amen? He can. That's true, for no man can tame his tongue. But the good news is that what man cannot do, God can. God can enable you to tame your tongue. How bad do you want it? How does he do it? He does it by dealing with the root problem which lies behind the tongue. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 15, verse 19, 
that the real problem, listen to this, I'm about to explain some things to you. Matthew 15, verse 19, I'm going to paraphrase. Jesus is saying that the real problem is not the tongue, but the heart. He said that the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. According to Jesus, the tongue is simply a neutral messenger boy that carries the words from the heart. You notice what I said earlier? This is why I said it's not literally fire in your tongue. It, it's your tongue dipping in the well of your heart and just out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this last six notes here. According to Jesus, the tongue is simply a neutral messenger boy that carries the words from the heart. It is the bucket that goes down to the well, dips in what is there, and then dumps it out of the mouth what it picks up. The good news is that Jesus promises a new and clean heart to all those who will turn from their sin. Do you understand that? Somebody's got to do some turning, don't they? Isn't it time that the church did some turning in Jesus' name? Amen? Amen. If God moves upon a person's heart, he can also move upon his tongue. When a person believes the gospel, Christ starts changing the person, including their speech. Like I said, the good news is that Jesus promises a new and clean heart to all those who will turn from their sin and trust in him. No cruel or unfair words. Listen to me now. I'm Listen to me every word of this sentence. No cruel or unfair words have ever come from a heart controlled by God. A heart controlled by God. Does that make sense? No cruel or unfair words have ever come from a heart controlled by God. No bigoted conversation has ever come from a heart controlled by God. No lying speech has ever come from a heart controlled by the God of truth. The night that Peter stood warming himself by the fire and denied that he knew Jesus was that night Jesus under control of his heart. Not yet. Not yet. Amen? Not yet. So, you know, listen to me. I, I, sometimes I say, Carl, you can't go there. People will think such and such. Well, you know what? Do you hear the toilet flush on that in the distance? Listen to me carefully. When you hear me talk like this, because this is what God's saying to me, all right? He's saying it to me. He's saying, if you don't let me help you with that, all right? Now, look, I know this is going to be controversial. Brace yourself. But maybe you need to recheck what's really down here on the inside. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe it's time for us to do a little inventory, you know. Um, God don't play. Jesus don't play neither. Jesus look at a bunch of people and say, you're a goat. Get over there. What do you mean I'm a goat? Didn't I do this in your name? Didn't I do that? Don't you think it's ironic in the, in the movie um, where the rapture took place, one of the key characters left behind was who? The pastor in the local church. Am I right or wrong? So don't you think I take my words pretty seriously? Amen? Hey, if you think I don't talk to God about things like this every day of my life, you're a sad mistake. And if I'm going to do it, and I'm going to lead people, you need to do it. We all need to. You know, just take a little inventory. You can be confident in your relationship with God, right? Just quit. What happens when you got one foot in a boat that floats and one foot in a boat that sinks? When the boat, you got your weight distributed. If a boat here goes down, you're going down. You ain't going to automatically your weight shift to the boat that's floating. Your weight shifts to the boat that's sinking. Let's get out of the sinking boat. Amen? When God controls the heart, he controls the tongue. So believe the gospel and allow God to tame your tongue. And I wrote, Amen question mark, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, all the way across the page. Is it amen or oh me? What's it going to be? Amen? 
you know what? I, I tell you what, you, you, you think I just get saved every day. I don't, but I, you understand what I'm saying? I talk to God. I thank him for saving my soul. I thank him for the shed blood of Jesus Christ every day of my life. Amen? I commit all of these things to him. In other words, I stay in the fight. I don't quit. Why? Because he doesn't quit. Amen? Amen? I'm telling you, revival will come to the church in America. Revival will come to the church in America when they start understanding this message. You ever wonder why revival always starts in the church? It isn't the lost that need to be revived or restarted. It's the children of God that need to be restarted. Revival starts in the house of God. Amen? Always starts in the house of God. I mean, if it doesn't, I don't, I don't know of an example where it doesn't. What happens is, you know, God falls in a service and things, something happens. Something out of the ordinary happens. And next thing you know, people are talking about it. And people want to come see what God's doing. Amen? And people that need salvation in their lives, they, they come to that place because they want to know if it's real. They want to know if it's real. I've had people attack me verbally on uh, secular jobs and and they wanted to see me lose my temper they wanted to see me fail but i learned the hard way that down deep inside they were hoping all along i wouldn't no matter how hard they came at me they were hoping all along that there was no cracks no cracks i'm gonna tell you this and it's over I'm going to pray for you. I don't care if we all get saved again tonight. You hear what I'm saying? Matter of fact, if we all need to get saved tonight, let's all get saved tonight, all right? All right? There was a man that worked in a fabrication shop on, on the slope with me, and he hated me and made it clear that he hated me because I was a Christian. And he, you know, I'm, I'm going to shorten it way down. He, he... Um, threatened me he did all kinds of things and it just went on and on and on and to the point where and i just being me i just being the christian that, that god was was building he i was in a building a construction process you understand what i'm saying god's building me just like he's building you right and there were people who came to me and said look look we're gonna after lunch today we're just gonna take this guy out back and we're going to whoop him we're just gonna we're gonna beat him to the ground we're tired of the way he treats you. And I go, no, that is the worst thing in the world you can do. Don't do it. Let him be. Let him be. He was trying to make my life miserable, all right? But I, I learned he was really hoping that I wouldn't, I wouldn't crack, wouldn't go down. God was good to me. Later on, six months later, I ran into him in the parking lot of Fred Myers. The story still tears my heart up. I ran into him, and I thought, oh, great. You know, here's my buddy. Here's my friend, my pal, right? My, my antagonist. You understand what I'm saying? An antagonist. That's what he was. And he stopped me, and he wanted to talk to me. Now, you'd think this would be one of those stories where he said, oh, he just wanted to apologize. No, he didn't want to apologize. He wanted to tell me what happened. A few weeks after we were separated, he was a welder, and he had climbed into a piece of pipe that was big enough for him to climb into along with his welder helper. And they climb about 30 feet into this pipe. They got these extra long leads. They have to go in and back weld a weld. You understand what I'm saying? They're inside the pipe. Well, they know their problems with these welds because they hook x-ray machines to them in the x-ray. They can see all the way through that steel pipe, right? The guys that do the x-ray and didn't know he was in there and they put the clamps on the pipe, and they x-rayed him with 100 times as much radiation as a human being is supposed to absorb in their lifetime. And uh, the doctors, you know, they just told him, you got about six months to live. There's absolutely nothing. He got cooked, cooked inside that pipe. You understand? And uh, all he wanted then was prayer. That's all. He wanted was prayer. And so uh, 
I never saw him again after that day, but I hope to see him in heaven when I get there. All right? It's not to be played with. It's not to be played with. Thank you for sending that message out, Nathan. I appreciate that. You know what?